Hey everyone, welcome back to Lab Coats. As I'm sure we're all aware, the internet is a wonderful place, overflowing with intelligence and sophistication. But sometimes, it can tell us things that don't entirely align with the truth. For example, you can't make diamonds by microwaving charcoal and peanut butter. And you can't create perpetual motion from magnets and an old PC fan. That's just not how the real world works. So when I saw this Science Madness post claiming I could make phosphoryl chloride from table salt, I kind of thought this might be one of those not-so-true cases. I mean, surely if this worked, there would be a lot more home chemists doing it, because phosphoryl chloride is an extremely useful chemical. This stuff turns alcohols into organophosphates, forms the similarly useful phosphorus trichloride upon heating with iron, and it even helped Nile Red convert styrofoam into cinnamon flavor. So the idea that it could somehow be made from ordinary table salt did seem a bit far-fetched when I first read about it. But I have been rewarded by sketchy syntheses before, and since the reagents were reasonably cheap, I decided it'd be worth giving it a shot. Now, surprisingly, the whole procedure only called for two relatively simple ingredients sodium chloride, and phosphorus pentoxide. Sodium chloride is easy enough to obtain as regular old table salt, but phosphorus pentoxide is a bit harder to come by. Fortunately, sites like OnyxMet and even Etsy sell it for reasonably cheap, so I was able to get my hands on some. To get started, I first weighed out 38 grams of table salt, which I set on my hot plate to dry. Sodium chloride has a tendency to absorb moisture from the air, which not only destroys the end product, but also strongly inhibits the reaction by coating the phosphorus pentoxide particles in a non-reactive layer of phosphoric acid. This layer will itself react with the phosphoryl chloride as it forms, converting it into undesirable hydrogen chloride and pyrophosphoric acid. Essentially, water poisons this reaction and will totally ruin your yield, even in small amounts. And as I learned the hard way, you can't just add more pentoxide to absorb it all. Cooking it out is really the best option. After drying all my salt, I added just over 60 grams of phosphorus pentoxide, and then blended the two ingredients together into a fine, well-mixed powder. The better mixed the components are, the better they will react, so this part is fairly important. Keep in mind that simply mixing the components doesn't actually yield phosphoryl chloride. For the reaction to take place, the mixture must be heated to at least 250 degrees Celsius. While this is blisteringly hot, it's not exactly out of reach for most home chemists. A burner or torch would probably work fine for most people, but I personally wanted better temperature control, so I went with the electric kiln that I built in a previous video. For my first attempt, I decided to piece together my own steel retort, using these threaded pipes that I had bought at my local Home Depot. Steel is probably one of the best materials for a reactor like this, given its availability and extreme temperature tolerance, but it can be problematic if you aren't careful. As I mentioned before, iron can reduce phosphoryl chloride to phosphorus trichloride at high temperatures. This process not only introduces some trichloric contamination, but it also leads to corrosion of the steel, which may be catastrophic under certain conditions. For example, if you overfill the reactor, like I did here. It might be hard to tell, but the steel is actually burning here. That reddish smoke is iron oxide. The end cap was screwed on as tight as I could get it, but evidently, the pressure formed by the clog was high enough to force phosphoryl chloride around the pipe threads, burning them away in the process. In case you couldn't tell, this was the last time I ever used that retort. On the bright side, the acidic vapors and characteristic smell created during the distillation did confirm that this was a viable method for producing phosphoryl chloride. You win this round, Science Madness. But how could I improve upon my first test and actually succeed in collecting the phosphoryl chloride? Well, glassware. Basically, I just had to ditch the whole steel retort idea and go back to using good old-fashioned glassware. I found an old flask that I didn't mind replacing, filled it with my pentoxide salt mixture, and then threw together a quick distillation setup with an actual condenser. There is a chance that the reaction flask could be damaged by the high temperatures and hot phosphorus pentoxide, which is why I picked a flask that was already etched and somewhat unsightly. This was a 250 milliliter flask, and it happened to fit nicely within my kiln. With everything set up, the temperature was slowly raised to around 500 degrees Celsius. I don't know if this temperature was ever actually reached, since all the phosphorus pentoxide would have theoretically vaporized at that point, but setting it to 500C definitely ended up working for this reaction. 
After some time, the material inside the flask began to puff up, with a lot of scary looking fumes being released in the process. And slowly but surely, a transparent liquid began climbing the flask and collecting at the condenser head. To help force the distillation along, I covered as much exposed area as I could with glass insulation. It took a while, but eventually, I had my first few drops of phosphoryl chloride. Progress was very slow though, so I tried increasing the temperature a little. This, however, proved to not be the best idea. The temperature inside the reaction vessel finally managed to exceed 360 degrees Celsius, which caused some of the phosphorus pentoxide to sublimate and create this corrosive snowstorm inside my flask. Fortunately, I was able to cool things off before any of the pentoxide actually made it over. Unfortunately, this wasn't the end of my problems. The reactants inside the flask began to fuse together under the high temperatures, forming a sort of gummy salt cake which continued to expand as the reaction progressed. This thankfully ended up shrinking when I backed off the heat a little, but it did get pretty close to creating another clog. So for anyone looking to replicate this procedure, I would recommend keeping things below 340 degrees Celsius which is the point where phosphorus pentoxide starts to melt. However, if you've accidentally left a bit of moisture in your reactants and things are having trouble starting, you can try bumping up the temperature like this to help things mingle and overcome the phosphoric acid barrier coating the pentoxide. After running the distillation for a few hours, I was eventually left with a few milliliters of crystal clear phosphoryl chloride. Overall, the yield here was pretty bad, considering how much material I started with, but as I pointed out earlier, the presence of moisture will strongly inhibit this reaction. And for this second run, I didn't dry my salt nearly as well, which is probably why I got so little phosphoryl chloride. My phosphorus pentoxide was also a bit clumpy, so it's possible that moisture had already gotten in and ruined a decent amount of it. This just goes to show how much water affects this reaction, and why it's important to rigorously dry everything before beginning. If you plan to attempt this procedure, an inert atmosphere might be beneficial, and if possible, I'd recommend purifying your pentoxide via sublimation to get rid of any phosphoric acid, which again, can destroy your end product. Also, quick side note, the cleanup for this reaction was actually way easier than I thought it would be. The solid byproducts are all water soluble, and with a bit of mixing, they all came out of the flask without leaving any residue or noticeable etching. Now, this wouldn't be a lab coats video if I didn't try at least a few reactions with my end product. But first, let me quickly describe the smell since that seems to be pretty much the only other constant in my videos. Phosphoryl chloride has a musty, pungent smell, which to me, kind of smells vaguely similar to bad Parmesan cheese. I wouldn't recommend inhaling more than a quick whiff of this deadly cheese juice though, since its vapors do form hydrochloric and phosphoric acid on contact with your lungs. As for reactions, phosphoryl chloride really doesn't have very many eye-catching ones that I'm aware of. It does form the Vilsmeyer reagent when mixed with dimethylformamide, but that's just a colorless solid. I tried getting a small amount to crystallize here, but nothing ever really solidified. Its corrosive properties were also surprisingly underwhelming, at least when I tested it on this piece of paper. And similar to acetic anhydride and sulfur dichloride, phosphoryl chloride really doesn't have a very violent reaction with water, which I guess I should have expected at this point. However, when paired with a reactive enough substance, phosphoryl chloride does show at least some oxidizing capabilities, for example, here it is with magnesium powder. This isn't really an insane reaction, but it is noticeably faster than plain magnesium in air. Interestingly, it doesn't seem to react very quickly with sodium. I guess the metal just passivates way too quickly for a major reaction to occur. Maybe the mixture is impact sensitive? It did flare up a little when I ignited it, but the whole thing never really caught fire. My watch glass did end up fracturing though, which finally got the sodium burning. Nothing like a runaway alkali metal fire to spice up your lab. For my final reaction, I decided to try a brand new reagent that I'm proud to introduce to my channel for the first time. Lithium aluminum hydride. This stuff is super reactive, and when I dripped some phosphoryl chloride onto it, it surprisingly didn't ignite. It did start to turn green though, which I believe might be due to some kind of weird complex forming. This is because ordinary lithium and aluminum salts are usually colorless, and also, they don't usually react quite like this to fire. Whatever that energetic substance was, I think it merits at least one more flame test. For science, of course. 
That was pretty cool. If anyone knows what this stuff is, please let me know in the comments. Alright, now I think we can wrap this video up. As always, I'd like to thank everyone for watching, and encourage you to subscribe if you like my content. I have a ton of videos in the making that I'm personally very excited for, including a synthesis for a legal version of methamphetamine, and a first-of-its-kind demo of a compound that just might be one of the most explosive materials on Earth. And yes, this compound is worse than azido azide azide. More info coming soon. A special thanks goes out to all the dedicated Labcoat supporters. Without their donations, I truly wouldn't be where I am today. Remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Labcoats, out.